paint drip splatters and runs, revealing a series of images. A woman playing violin, then in a bright pink costume, then in a blind skier penny atop a mountain. The drip finally lands, revealing text in print and braille. Unsightly Opinions. Hi, welcome to Unsightly Opinions. My name is Tamara. Today, we are going to be discussing all of the blind cleaning tips you have ever wanted to know. I pride myself in having a very neat, tidy, and clean home, so I'm going to share all the tips that I've picked up from other blind folks, just from trial and error over the years, and being reinforced by other sighted folks on what are the correct ways to do things. There are 1,027 ways that will probably work to get your place clean, so take whatever I say with a grain of salt and absolutely share your ideas, your tips, your techniques down below so we can grow, learn, and come up with solutions together. Today, we are going to discuss countertops, dusting, mopping, vacuuming, doing dishes, and all of the general household chores that you'll probably see most people doing, and how I've adapted those chores for me as a blind person. There will be timestamps listed down below, so if you want to jump to a section or you have questions about something or the way I do it, you can check that out down in the description box. But we'll start with some general tips and tricks and then go into the specifics from there. The first thing I want to discuss is gloves. I am typically a no glove cleaning kind of gal. My hands, and by extension sometimes, my feet are my eyes when it comes to cleaning. You're going to hear me say it a lot. My fingers are going to be what tells me when a surface is clean or not. So putting a barrier between my fingers and the surface that I'm cleaning is going to make it more challenging. Obviously, there are some surfaces that will leave fingerprints if you use your hands to touch them afterwards, but for the most part, I don't use any kind of gloves unless it's something really caustic that I have to use for cleaning, or unless it's really, really disgusting and I don't want to touch it. If you are using gloves, I will almost never use the really thick gloves that a lot of people wear for doing dishes. I will opt for medical exam gloves because they will fit my fingers better and I will get a lot more finger sensitivity or a lot more sensation as to what I'm working with than something that's really, really thick. And if you do opt for exam gloves, make sure you get something that's in the right size because something that fits your fingers really well is going to work when you're trying to feel for small details versus something that's much too big like these, which are just one size fits all. They don't fit me at all and I have a terrible time feeling feeling anything because there's so much material moving back and forth across my fingers, I can't feel what I'm actually supposed to be trying to examine. Tip number two, opt for gentle cleaners when you can. Harsh caustic chemicals can be really damaging to your hands, especially if you're not wearing gloves. I don't want anybody burning themselves or hurting themselves because they accidentally splashed bleach into their eyes. So I'll use my steamer 99 times out of 100 or dish soap and water. Only on a very rare occasion will I pull pull out my entire cleaning box of chemicals and use those. I do have them should the situation arise, but I rarely use them. Tip number three is do it twice. When it comes to wiping a counter, vacuuming a floor, if you don't have perfect technique, and goodness knows I don't, and I've been practicing for a very long time, just doing it twice, wiping the counter once, and then just wiping it again will guarantee that you've probably hit 100% of the surface at least once. If you're really concerned about something looking neat and tidy, that's my go-to. Number four would be things that automate your cleaning experience. We found a used robot vacuum on Kijiji for about $50 and it has been an absolute game changer. I went from having to vacuum every single day to I vacuum maybe once every two weeks. My next tip is always work top to bottom, especially if you can't see small details like dust, crumbs, etc. When you're wiping something, oftentimes the dirt is going to fall down. So if you're cleaning the top of the bookshelf, the dust is probably gonna fall onto the floor or fall onto the counter or fall onto the surface that's lower down below where you were just cleaning. So if you work from top to bottom, you only have to clean once. It doesn't make sense to vacuum your kitchen, then wipe your counters, knock all the crumbs on the floor because then you have to vacuum the kitchen again. I always work in a very strategic, logical, patterned way so that I'm 
minimizing the amount of work I'm doing so I don't have to do it over and over again. That leads right into my next tip, which is patterns and zones. I always work within very defined boundaries. That might be finding a boundary between my island and my other counter behind me that's about three feet apart and working between those two areas with the vacuum and making sure that I'm hitting every inch within a very specific small area. Or it might mean creating a square, which is created by the length of my outstretched arm to the right and the length of my outstretched arm forward and then working through different quadrants or zones on the counter to make sure I've hit every single part. My next tip is, I've mentioned it briefly, you can use your feet just as well as your eyes to tell when something is clean. My feet are usually the indicator telling me when my floors are dirty. I will almost always wash my floors in bare feet because I'm going to be able to feel those crumbs, I'm gonna be able to feel the dirt or the stickiness, and then I know where to focus my efforts. My next tip is keeping a list or a routine. One, so you're not spending all of your time and energy cleaning on one day every week, but splitting up the tasks so that you don't exhaust yourself if you have fatigue issues like myself. But second, so that you know when it was last done. For me as a blind person, I very much have an out of sight, out of mind kind of mentality because I'm not going to see when the toilet's dirty. I'm not going to see when the walls on the shower might need to be cleaned. I'm not necessarily going to know when there's dust on surfaces. So having that routine or that list really helps keep things on track so that you can have a clean, tidy home all the time. One final tip when it comes to organizing cleaning products. If you are unable to read the labels, there's lots of different ways to distinguish one product from the other. I really like putting my products in different shaped containers. All of my spray bottles are a different size, shape, so I can identify them quickly. If you aren't super confident with that, you can put tactile markings, different patterns, you can glue things to them so that you can differentiate them, and you can always waft the scent of the product towards you, so get different different scents so you can identify what's going to be what. Never ever breathe a chemical directly into your nose because you don't want to burn your lungs or your nose. That's about it for my general tips. Let's dive straight in and start out with some dishes. I know most people love to wear these really thick rubber gloves when they're washing their dishes. In my kitchen, they're nowhere to be found. We use our bare hands because our hands are our eyes. We're not going to be able to tell if a dish is clean unless we're able to use the tips of our fingers. So yes, it might dry out our hands a little bit, but it makes sure that your dishes are clean and you don't have disgusting dried food on your plates. I have a few dishes in my sink right now, so let's go through and wash some of them. I often opt for handheld dish scrubbers rather than the ones with the long handle because again, it gets me closer to what I'm working on and gives me more fine motor control so I can get in there with my fingers if I need to and feel if the dirt has come off. Once I've got a little bit of soap on my brush, I'll turn on the water just to start rinsing the dish and get a sense of how dirty it is with my hands. I'll stick my hands in the dish to see what's going on. This one doesn't seem too dirty, so I'm just gonna kind of scrub it up from the outside, making sure I'm covering the entire surface, then the inside, and then I feel with my hands, oh, and there's something stuck right there, so I can scrub at it a little bit more. That feels pretty clean to me now, so then we just give it a rinse. All the while, we're feeling to make sure there's nothing that we missed that might be crusted on or dirty. And then we pop it in the other sink. If we have something with really caked on dirt, I usually just soak it first for a few minutes with nice hot water, and then it's a lot easier to clean. So we'll leave that for a second. Glasses are very much the same. I just scrub the outside and the inside. Most of the gunk, I realize, accumulates at the bottom, so I give that a really good scrub. And anywhere lips or hands might have touched. And then I get in there with my hand to make sure there's nothing sticky or gooey. Give it a rinse. And in the clean half of the sink it goes. Rinse and repeat, quite literally. While we're doing a quick time lapse of washing, I wanted to mention that I don't fill the sink up with water because I'm not going to know when the water gets dirty, so it's easier for me to just keep the dishes sitting at the bottom of the sink and wash them one at a time with water. Now back to that gunky bowl. Just after it's sat for a second, we're just gonna give it a good scrub, outside and in. Gunk is gone. And on the clean side it goes. 
I'm going to finish up these last few dishes and then I'll join you when I'm done. Now that we've got the dishes finished, we're going to wash the sink. This is my top to bottom rule. If you wash your sink before your dishes, it's not going to make any sense because you're gonna have to wash your sink again after you do your dishes. Now that my dishes are done, I give my dish scrubby a scrub. We're gonna get some more soap on it. And then I just scrub my sink top to bottom, making sure I get all the grime, gunk, nasty things off of my sink, including the sink, what is this called, a sink stopper? Starting at the top of the walls, going all the way down to the bottom of the sink. And I always give the bottom of sink a real good scrub, because that's usually where most of the gunk decides to hide. Give my scrubby a rinse, and then I give my whole sink a rinse, starting at the back, rinsing everything down. I feel afterwards to make sure it feels clean, to make sure all the gunk is gone. And if I feel anything, I'll give it another scrub. But that's how we finish. Most of the time when I do counters or surfaces, it's just a damp cloth or a damp cloth with dish soap. But if I'm concerned about sterilization, I use this steamer. This is a device that I wasn't sure I needed and I wasn't sure I'd ever use it, but it's something that I've found myself using in so many different situations because I want to be able to feel what I'm cleaning. I want to feel that it's clean when I'm done. This is a much safer alternative where I know that it's going to be sterile but I don't have any of those chemical residues left behind. I'll use my steamer for everything from sterilizing a countertop, doing floors, cleaning showers, doing the bathroom. It's great for so many different things and I'll even steam my clothes with it on a different setting. To get started, all I do is I put water in the top, it heats up, I can still touch it, it's warm to the touch, but it's not going to burn me. And I stick a microfiber cloth around the head that I wanna use, pop it to the end of my steamer, and I'm good to go. I stay away from the end with the microfiber cloth on it, but before I ever get into contact with something that's going to hurt me, I'm going to feel the heat and back away. So I've never actually been burned by my steamer. So even though it was something I was very concerned about at the beginning, thinking that it's something that I could hurt myself really badly, I have not hurt myself as of yet. And I think it's a much safer way of doing things. So like anything else when I'm cleaning, it's all about the patterns. I create zones. So for me, it's within an arm's length in front of me, usually about two and a half to three feet and about an arm's length outstretched. Again, that's probably about two and a half, three feet. And that's the zone I work in. And then I'll move to the next zone and the next zone and the next zone. So I just pull the trigger. And away we go. Once I've done a section, I'll dry it off with a microfiber cloth just to make sure I can feel that there's nothing left behind. If the cloth sticks, if I feel any grime, I'll stop and I'll scrub at it, but there was nothing in that section. I also find when I'm using the steamer, I have to use a lot less force to get stuck on dirt off of surfaces. So again, it just makes it a little bit easier if you have other mobility challenges or if you're blind like me. Okay, now that I've done the center, I'll just give it a good wipe again. And I actually felt something catch the cloth. So I'm gonna go back, find where that is right here. Give it a little scrub. And then it's gone. And that's why I use the cloth as well. It, it really helps you feel if there's anything left behind. And that's how I clean just about any countertop or surface. When it comes to something like dusting, I use that same pattern. I wipe in very defined parameters. So I start at the edge of something and go to the other edge and work along and almost think of it like I'm painting the surface to make sure that I'm not going to miss something. And if it's more than an arm's width, I do the same thing I do with a countertop and work in zones. I start at the edge and I wipe forward from one edge to the other edge, forward, forward, and I try and almost redo half of the section that I've done with each wipe just to make sure that I'm not missing something. And I keep a very flat palm so that if I'm touching with my fingers, I'm not getting good pressure. Whereas with my flat palm, I'm getting a lot of surface area with each swipe and that's dusting. When it comes to cleaning bathrooms, my process is identical to just about anywhere else in the house. I work top to bottom. I start with the highest things with dusting, 
then I work my way down to the mirrors, then the counters, then the toilet, then the floor. But specifically mirrors, which I haven't addressed yet, I'll usually pop on a glove because I am not going to be able to see if I'm leaving fingerprints behind on my mirror. The second reason is this is one of the few places where I absolutely do use chemicals. I use Windex on all of my mirrors because I haven't found a good solution and I can't tell if I'm leaving streaks behind when I'm wiping my mirrors. It's the most foolproof way that I've been able to find to clean my bathroom mirrors. My first step is moving anything out of the way that might get in the way of my cleaning. And then once the area is clear, I spray on some Windex right up at the top. And then I come in with a paper towel and I work my way across the mirror in long strokes all the way across the mirror. If there's something stuck to the mirror, usually I'll feel that the paper towel will jump or stutter or get stuck and then I'll just work my way top to bottom. And that's how I clean my mirrors. Over the years, I found vacuuming to be more art than science, but I still use the same basic principles as anything else when it comes to cleaning. Find your patterns, find your zones. And this kitchen is relatively straightforward because there's very defined boundaries. I have the counter on my left, I have the island on my right, and I have the stove in front of me as a very enclosed space. Try and work within the boundaries and act like a painter. I know everybody's really into those swiveling vacuums right now with the swiveling heads. I find that harder as a blind person personally because I have less control over where I'm moving. It might get under furniture better, but it makes it harder for me to tell where I'm going. And it took years of practice before I was really, really good at vacuuming. I'm going to explain what I'm going to do before I do it because you won't hear a darn thing while I'm vacuuming. So what I do is I start at an edge. Whatever edge that might be, it might be a wall, it might be a counter, it might be a table, a chair, something that's gonna be a defined boundary for the edge of where I'm going to start. And if it's a corner, even better. I'll work out from there. And I go all the way forwards until I hit the end of where I can travel, and then I come all the way back. So if I'm in a space that has a lot of open space, I work from the most defined edges out from there. And you'll start learning your space as you do it. And I don't vacuum very fast, I'm not fast because because I am going to deliberately try and run into things with my vacuum to make sure that I've hit everything and I'm not missing the edges where all the dust and dirt likes to accumulate. So as I move forward within that space, I usually work in three foot zones, kind of the outstretch of my arm and back to my body. So I'll lean forwards and lean back, and then I slowly move back and forth, almost like I'm painting the floor, working through sections where I get along a wall, and then I'll get the next section, but I repeat half of what I've done with the vacuum over each section, just to make sure that I'm not missing anything. So let's show you what that looks like. Here I'm starting in the corner of my kitchen. Moving about three steps back from the corner, I push the vacuum forward, trailing along one wall until I encounter the other wall defining the corner. Pulling the vacuum back toward myself, I use a slight diagonal backstroke to position the vacuum slightly to the right for the next forward stroke. I repeat this pattern of forward stroke and slight diagonal backstroke until I reach the end of my section. Then I take three steps backward and start again, in this case using the wall of my kitchen as the starting line. I usually push the vacuum forward just a little extra to make sure I'm not missing anything. I would always rather go over an area twice than miss part of the floor. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. I'm happy to explain my process further. Or if you want to see other topics related to cleaning, maybe making beds, laundry, folding clothes, etc., leave those requests down below. I can always make another video or a part two. If you enjoy content like this, please don't forget to subscribe. Consider hitting the like button, sharing, engaging down below or on any of my other social media accounts. But that's all I have for you this time. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.